Warning, the following podcast contains coarse language and spoilers for the film and the title of the podcast. Now playing Movie Reviews in 20 Qs. Hello, you goddamn fantastic people, and welcome to the podcast, Movie Reviews in 20 Qs, the show where we review a movie by asking 20 weird and wonderful questions about it. You guys, it's been a while. I've missed you all. I have missed you all. Liz has done a stellar job keeping up the podcast here and there. But, uh, you know, the true master is back. The one that you guys want to listen to every single week. He's back. He's back. It's me. It's me. God, Mr. Fucking Arrogant. Anyway, uh, the reason why I've been dragged back, kicking and screaming, not really. I've missed all you guys so much. But the reason why I've come back is because I guessed it on an episode. And I wanted to get the host of that episode, Thomas, from the history of Aotearoa New Zealand. I wanted to get him on. I wanted to do an episode. And, of course, I picked a film that we're all going to go watch. But, Thomas, how are you? How are you doing? G'day, I'm good. Yes, I did finally manage to get you onto my podcast, which is pretty difficult because to get onto my podcast, you have to have like credentials and shit. <laughs> um, so we recently hit episode 100 and I actually had both of you, both uh, Waffles is also here. Hello. Hello, Waffles. How's it going? I've taken over your job. Yeah, yeah no, Hello, no, no, I was going to get to that point. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, no, it was a good, it was a good lot of fun. We did like a, a game show type thing, kind of based around New Zealand history, which was pretty cool. Lot, lots of laughs were had. And of course, we're not going to say yeah. who won. You're going to have to listen nah, to that. We're not going to say who, no, who, no, who won. Not. There'll be no um, showboating. Or... There was a point scoring system, as adjudicated by me. There was no favoritism involved whatsoever. If anything, I was probably too harsh. But no, it's good. It's good to be back. Especially when it's uh, something quite cool like uh, Black Panther: Wakanda Forever, I really liked the first one, and so I was I was pretty pretty juiced for this one. Especially when I learned like who the villain was and oh, stuff. Hell yes, yep. I mean, I agree with all of that, and I was very happy to come on your podcast. I, I laugh at the fact that you said you normally have to have credentials to come on my podcast, and then you hosted a guest mm. show where it was like a. Look how smart I am. I know all this stuff about New Zealand history, and I'm getting it on three dum-dums, and I'm going to ask some questions. So, like, the credentials for that episode was how dumb of a person can I get on? What? I'm super dumb. So well, the credentials, on there, the, creden- <laughs> the credentials for that episode were, you have to be funny. So those were your credentials, is that yes. you're funny. You hear that, um, mum? Not that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which um, I think I think shined through pretty well. The The New Zealand history knowledge... Not so much. Again, not to spoil it, but Sam, you did have your your particular strengths, which I think for some, for me at least, was unexpected. I think it was unexpected not... for Sam as well. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly. No, 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 no. I always go in with a like, um, like leave them surprised as opposed to, you know, like setting high expectations and disappointing people. I'd rather set low expectations and leave them surprised. It's always been my thing. Yeah, exactly. The old um, IT mythos of was it uh, under promise, over deliver. Yes, um. <laughs> absolutely. But we had a blast, didn't we? Waffles, who was of course oh, as, uh, Thomas. Yes, of course. Guest. We had a blast, right? Oh, it was so much fun. I, I would definitely recommend uh, after people listen to this episode, go and download uh, the 100th episode of Hans and listen to that. Uh, of course. You probably need to listen to the other 99 in order to actually be fully up on your New Zealand history to actually understand what we're talking about. So, yeah, go just listen to the entire back catalogue of Hans. And, yeah, I highly recommend. It's a good podcast. There very, we go. This is sound right. Uh, yeah, so we're kind of forever. Normally, I hit you guys with a cast list, but everybody knows what this film's about. It's a massive Marvel film. It has a score of 84% on Rotten Tomatoes. Score of 7.4 out of 10 on IMDb. How surprising. 67% on Metacritic. Wow, it's getting worse by the... By the scorer, basically, and what it's we normally do—it's a do... good indication of how racist the chart, uh, the um, <laughs> the scoring system is. Like, how racist are the reviewers? You can actually use this film as a really good metric. Absolutely, there you go, Metacritic. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, whoever's seen it the most recently normally just gives us a, like a bit of a plot, and somebody went and saw it again for a second time last night, didn't they? Didn't I did. Yes. Okay, so what's the plot? What's the plot of Wakanda uh, Forever? Uh, so the king is dead. Long live the queen. The Western worlds are getting up to their colonizing bullshit, and Wakanda and Tolokan aren't having it. Uh, but then they end up having a scrap, and then after that, they sort of sort their differences out at the end of a spear. Uh, that's a very succinct plot summary. 
of lots of cool people in very colorful clothing fighting each other. I like it. I'll take it. That'll do. Uh, if you haven't heard this podcast before, what we do is we review a movie by asking 20 weird and wonderful questions about it. We start with 10 that can be applied to any film. We then move through three personal questions that we thought of while we were watching this film before finishing on a Patreon question. One we always start with, compliment sandwich, one thing good, one thing bad, and one thing good if we liked it, one thing bad, one thing good, one thing bad if we didn't, or the hyperbole sandwich, one thing good, one thing great, and one thing good if we're going to give it a score over 10,000 out of 10,000. Thomas, lead us off. What do you got, bud? I, I went with a compliment sandwich because um, I thought it was pretty good. I, I thought the aesthetic was amazing. Mm. I really liked the aesthetic of the first film and like the music and, and all that sort of stuff. The Mesoamerican stuff for me was really, really cool. Representation wise is obviously really good to have some Mesoamerican uh, characters, actors, architecture, clothes, uh, the language. Shit. I could, I could literally sit there and listen to like two hours of people speaking Mayan and Wakandan and that could be the entire movie. And I'd be like, this is great. Uh, I thought that was really good. Bad thing, uh, there's a bit too much going on in a lot of different respects in terms of like themes and stuff, which I understand why this movie had to be a lot of different things due to real world things that happened, mm. i.e. Chadwick Boseman had died. And so it kind of had to be, uh, you, you know, if you kind of think that that perhaps if it ha- that hadn't happened, they could have done the entire film more or less as is. And so because he had died, they had to chuck in that kind of extra theme of, you know, he's died and we have to honor him and all that sort of stuff, which is good and appropriate. And I think that was all fine. But adding all this stuff into the film makes it long, makes it heavy. So, you know, there's a lot going on there. It means that a few characters get underrepresented and perhaps could have been on screen a bit more if there wasn't as much going on. Um mm. And my third one is just Angela Bassett. Yes! Um, which I think we all agree is just, uh, she was really good. Spoilers, I guess, but she, well, I mean, I guess it is spoilers, but she Always. dies halfway through the yep. film, which I, it kind of, to me, again, was kind of like, I understand why this had to happen, but I'm like r- kind of fucking annoyed <laughs> that it did. <laughs> you know, because I was like, you, like, you got rid of like your best character or I, your second best character, in my opinion in the entire film it was funny it was kind of i was trying to figure out a way to fit this in there but like she went out like a badass don't get me wrong Mm. but at the same time when they showed the promos of like okay there's gonna be another black panther in this and like the way shuri was sort of like i don't really you know uh, you know sort of rejecting all that mythos i would have loved it if she'd actually donned the suit and gone out like a badass you know like like, don't get me wrong saving riri awesome all that sort of shit but if she'd taken the herb and be like, fucking Shuri, like, sort your shit out, like, become a badass yourself, and just fucking took on Namor, and we'd had a, like, a massive fight where she ends up dying. In front of mm. Shuri, I would have been like, fuck, this movie is awesome. That would have got me to hyperbole. I'm just spoiling my own answer here, but yeah, that would have got me hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a square out of 10,000... Oh, shit, here we go. That's a good question. 10,000 spears. I think it was, like, a, probably an 8,000... Eight and a half thousand. That's roughly where I'd put it. I think it's not a perfect film, yeah. but I thought it was it was pretty good. What about you, waffles. Yeah, I, I, the look of this film uh, was amazing. The cinematography, everything. I'm going to throw the sound design in there as well for that. The whole mm. experience of the film, you know, regardless of characters and plots, just the you know physical experience of it was just beautiful. Absolutely had an amazing time. Yeah, I think all of the actors were bringing their A game. I, I think, you know, everybody in this film, you could see the passion. You could see that they were, like, throwing their whole heart at the screen, and I really appreciated that. And fuck it, I'm going hyperbole sandwich because this film Whoa! just hit me right in the field. Um, oh, any, shit. Any film that can make me cry four times and, like, fuck toxic masculinity, this film made me cry, <laughs> and I loved it. Uh, and so any film that, like, I understand the structural stuff. I understand, like, why people would have issues and caveats and things like that. But for me, cinema is an experience. And I don't know, maybe it is because of that real world stuff, um, because this film was touching on a lot of real world issues. Um, but I don't know, just really seeing it twice, it, like, hit me really hard both times. And I kind of wasn't expecting that. 
Hey, so, hey, yeah, fuck it. Like, um, I'm there with you, man. Like, I don't cry during movies. And, like, at the start, where we get a very poignant scene where we don't see, uh, yeah. where we don't see Black Panther, but we see Shuri struggling to try and save his life. I was like, sitting yep. there, I was like, this is probably the point where most people start crying, but not me. And then they started showing the Marvel credits, which every yes. movie replaced every single one of them. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and it's dead silent Blubbering. as well. Dead silent. It's dead That's silent. That's when it got me. And I think yeah. the other the other thing that I quite liked about that aspect was, it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's a throwaway line, but Shuri in one line does mention that T'Challa did was like struggling with an illness and didn't tell yes. anyone yeah. until it was too late that she could help him, mm. which is, I mean, obviously like th- they couldn't help Chadwick Boseman either way, but like that was the story of his illness was he didn't tell anyone until basically he had died. Yeah. It came as a surprise um, to so many so I people. That was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah. And so I thought that was quite a, a, a nice thing that they'd kind of taken that real world experience and put that into the movie it was yeah. I don't know. I thought there was just a a very small detail that they didn't really have to do anything with, but it was nice that they took. They could have just said, oh, he was sick and he died," yep. you know. But like the fact that they added that little bit of extra flavor, mm. if you will, yep. I thought was you know just a little bit nice. You know, I thought that was quite yep. quite cool. Very very touching, and you really got the sense that the entire cast and crew like had so much love for Chadwick that they were sort of almost using this film as catharsis and you could mm. feel that like the feel like you could feel that their passion for the project the their passion just for Chadwick as and the amazing human being that he was mm. and like that like that opening scene was just like just all of that just poured out and it was just beautiful mm. yeah so I don't know as many spears as there are blades of grass in Wakanda. <laughs> yes! I like that. Nice. I like that. Okay, so one of my good things was what Waffles was mentioned, was that how respectively they blurred life, you know, real life with the movie, like that, and just like seeing Letitia Wright sitting at there at the end crying, it was just like, you, you could tell it wasn't faked, you can tell that wasn't acted, you know, like it seemed like they captured a real moment from her. I feel like they did well with that, you know. The other, the other good thing, before I get into my fond, into my bad thing, is a compliment sandwich, but the other, the other good thing is, like, I'm going to go full Marvel nerd. Namor's a dick. He's a massive yes! fucking dick in the Marvel Arrogant, comics. Imperious he, Rex bastard. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, like, widely considered as the first anti-hero of superheroes because he was just such a fucking dick. And one, in one comic, he's, you know, joined the Avengers or he's helping the Fantastic Four. And the next he's evading fucking Earth and he's like killing everyone and trying to fuck up, you know, Black Panther and shit like that. He's a massive dick. And like, I feel like Marvel had a real challenge where they were like, okay, DC's done Aquaman and that is Namor's story. You know, like that, he was the fucking king of Atlantis and he like lived under the water and he was half human and he was half fucking Atlantean, all that sort of shit. The fact that, you know, like DC ripped him off, you know, with Aquaman 20 years or whatever afterwards, but it's like, like Marvel, like the MCU was at a like, oh, what the fuck do we do? And they've managed to take this character who's such a fucking wanker and like infuse him with all this backstory that's like, for me, it was like the right blend of like, okay, we've created good character motivations. We've created a really interesting and new and diverse sort of like backstory for him. This is really fucking awesome. And like, I was surprised. That was my other good thing. And then my bad thing was that there was some like CGI parts and especially scenes shot at the dark that were like really fucking bad and i remember like it, it sort of <laughs> takes you out of the movie where you're like what the fuck is happening and then like all i could think of was like holy shit imagine when this gets to disney plus this is gonna be really fucking bad this is like it, it's mm. not game of thrones fucking season eight episode two or three or whatever that fucking you know the that final one where everyone was complaining about how their tvs are broken when they're trying to watch the episode it wasn't that bad but at the same time there was like cgi moments and like i know this is because the like Marvel fucking movies and TV are now drawing away every single like you know fucking company to like digitize all their films and all that sort of shit. So I know that all these companies are under like massive pressure, but it's like it's like being crowbarred straight out of the experience. We're like, what the fuck, you know? So that that was my real negative. Yeah, I agree. The CGI wasn't great, and I watched Thor a few weeks ago as well, which I think was arguably worse. Yeah, in yep, the CGI I'd agree. department yep, definitely worse. Um, it was not as good, which I thought getting a bit off topic here but i thought taika waititi going out and doing his little promo thing where he disses the cgi I was like come on bro this is your own fucking film like yeah 
and they're working like super under pressure, underpaid, non-unionized. Like, come on, fuck you! Like, <laughs> exactly. You know, <laughs> like if, if you're an artist, if you're an animator listening to this, like, fucking kudos to you. Like, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. exactly, exactly. Yeah, when we when we Marvel, say pay like, your artists, it, yeah, yeah, like when we say like the CGI is shit, like. We're on your side. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah we are. Like, we're not yeah. complaining about the animators. It's it's totally the, that yeah, structural yeah, yeah, yeah. fucking top down yeah. pressure crunch bullshit. Yeah, I need a movie delivered yeah. by this date, and by the way, it needs to have all this fucking you know CGI work done by this date before it, so that we can put out a yeah. trailer and all that sort of mm. shit. Of course, of course, you're going to get fucking terribleness. You know, when they're pumping out so many TV shows yeah. and movies, yeah. it's just like fucking hell. Yeah, like yeah, yeah computers exactly. only have so much processing. Like, exactly. yeah. yeah. My other thing that I wanted to bring up was, um, you did touch on it, Sam, which was, um, please stop making dark scenes that I can't fucking tell what's <laughs> yes! going on. Like, that was it. The scene on the bridge, I was like, I'm like, sure this is fucking awesome. Fucking but, hell. Yeah. Like, so many scenes uh, where it's just, it's really dark and... and, and it's I not think- lit properly. It's not lit properly. Yeah, yeah. it's not lit properly and, and all that sort of stuff. So an easy way for and you so, to tell yes. next time you're watching one of those scenes is to look out for shadows. If you can see shadows on the ground, that means they've shot it during ah. the day. Yeah. And they've tried and it's because it takes a lot to digitize out a shadow or to match the like, you know, yeah. yeah match the contrast and darkness um, levels without like completely ruining the scene. So that's that's yeah. That's a that's Inside a great a segue yeah. actually, Sam. Do we want to move on to the second question, <laughs> which I'm sure is about digitizing and removing things yeah well, we can i mean my score out of ten thousand is like about eight thousand three hundred or whatever but yeah let's move on what is question number two what is question number two thomas question number two is what is the big what was the biggest dick move uh in the movie i don't know about sam but i know me and waffles agree on what this is <laughs> go i want to hear it well, I, 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 well I, I think I'm making a slight presumption here because me and Waffles did kind of imply to each other over uh, over DM. But it has recently come out that um, Namor's uh, uh, actor, Tenoch Suerta, you know, he wears his togs, his boy shorts, uh, sorry, swim shorts for the Americans. We call them togs here in New Zealand. Uh, Tenor Schwerter has a fucking monster dong and it was someone's job to CGI out his bulge. And I feel like we've been robbed. <laughs> Imagine that, eh? Imagine being trimmed down for the movie. Just like... But I, it's... Is that a compliment or is that offensive? Like, I def- my dick's like, so name big, was a big dick job. character. Like, yeah, yeah, come yeah. On. Like, yeah. yeah, he's already a massive dick. He's got to have a massive he's dick. He's wearing them that tight for a reason. Like, I understand that the ocean's cold, but come on. Come on. That's a great answer. Um, I just I just think it's... I, I just think Disney is just being a fucking coward by having someone do that. And it's like, because that's the other thing, right? It's like, you have to pay money for someone to do this. It would be less work to just leave it. Yeah. You know, he's already a good looking man. Like, come on. Uh, anywho, uh, question number three. What is it, Waffles? Uh, what two characters have slept together and aren't telling anybody? I, I picked up a bit of flirtatiousness and a bit of uh, something and something between Okoye and Ramonda. You know, when Okoye was basically. Oh, no, that's not what I hear. Hey? No, no. Sorry, no. You, no, I thought we were going to be on the no? same page. Okay. No, nah, there was. Continue. It was like a little bit like when when Aquaria was getting fired, there was a little bit of a look of like, "Hey, man, we had something special." Like, yes, they did, but like, I feel like there was something even more special. So maybe that, maybe that. And T'Chaka was a dick. You reckon? Because they, I feel like, I feel like they're quite distant in age. So they're both consenting adults. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, a mature woman, you know, like. Don't get me started, bud. <laughs> 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 this podcast will go for about five minutes like i relieve myself and then yeah <laughs> what <laughs> anywho um what about oh, yeah. you thomas mine was namor and shuri i thought when they were having that bit where oh. you know she gets captured and they're chatting together about like where namor comes from and his backstory and shit fucking mad sexual chemistry yes. coming out yeah of scene, okay yes. yeah yeah <laughs> And I le- I legitimately thought, after that scene, I thought, I know how this is going to end. They're going to propose a marriage alliance between the two nations by Namor marries Shuri, and, and that's how the film is going to resolve. 
It didn't, to much to my disappointment. But I thought that I legitimately thought that's where it was going because I was like, there cannot be this much sexual chemistry in this scene if that's not what the filmmakers intend. Uh, in all but fairness, upon later, upon later thinking, I think it's just Tenot Schwerter is just he's, he's just that really charismatic. Yeah, he's hot. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's yeah. just really hot. Like, so uh, that's like inadvertently is just going to happen. Yeah, you, you'll Nate see him in a bit of driftwood, and like, yeah, he's going to bang that driftwood. He's going to fucking yeah. destroy that <laughs> yeah. driftwood. No, um, yeah, yeah. Neverina and Atuma. Oh yeah, of like, course. Yep, they're they're fucking on the side, like absolutely, totally. Yeah, you know, after battle, you got all the you know adrenaline's up, your hormones are going. Like, you know, it's just like, oh, we just killed some surface dwellers. There's, you know, do do you want to? Yeah, okay. Do you reckon if you sleep with one of those, one of them, you're joining the Mile Low Club? <laughs> Like, is that what Sherry joined in the Mile Low Club? <laughs> oh, oh. Yes. Yes. I hate that. Oh, <laughs> man. Moves us over to question number four. What was the most insane leap of logic in this film? I don't know if we all have the same thing for this. No, I'm curious. But anyway, Thomas. Um, I had a couple of different ones. But my, my main one was that, um, you know, kind of towards the end of the film, they're, like, trying to figure out how to beat Namor. And like what his weakness is basically and they figure out that he breathes water through his skin and as such if they heat him up and evaporate all that water that would weaken him and i was like okay and then like their whole plan hinges on this assumption that they have (laughs) and i was kind of like okay cool like great it's derived from if you're right a bit of evidence just like, yeah, he, exactly. He jumped one into the water evidence. before he did an attack. It was just like, oh, that must mean he's weak to fire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I kind of, I kind of thought that that was like, like it's a, it, it's a good theory and and all that sort of stuff. But I thought, like, are you going to come up with like anything Is there else? A plan B. Just yeah, just in case that you're not right. It's, you know? it's a good one. So that I is thought, true. It's a very good one. So I thought that was a not necessarily a leap of logic, but a fucking leap of faith <laughs> uh, <laughs> at the very least. But awesome. Um, Leaps of faith, like, kind of a theme of this film. Yeah, so I guess it's kind of the theme. Yeah, that's like, true. like that being said, though, um, like, hey, hey, what's our idea? We're going to microwave a guy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, I don't think too many people are going to fucking live through that. Like, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, but the other, the other stuff that I had was the masks that the the Talokans <laughs> mm. have on their face to help them breathe. You know, it's filled with water and stuff. I didn't spot anything else other than those breathing apparatus that's not how extracting oxygen from water works no they need a constant supply of water to be able to extract oxygen from it once you've exhausted all the oxygen from the water in that mask you're fucking dead so but that was kind of a bit like but but not (laughs) only that is he takes the mask off which he's been using to breathe water and then he puts it on shuri so that she can breathe Mm underwater with air yeah so that's also not how extraction of oxygen no, works like, no the extraction of oxygen from both air and water is different, Very different and chemistry. that's why you can't as a human breathe in underwater because you don't have it that's not how any of that works so no, like those masks that was me was being a bit up magic like, yeah they were magic yeah, like, so it would to last me that was me being seconds. a bit anal yeah but i mean it's yeah like good on like props for them for wearing protection yeah. but at the same time it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it doesn't matter if it's got hole like if it's got holes in it like it's exactly. not gonna do anything. it's not gonna protect you you know like <laughs> yeah Oof. the whole thing was to me was just like that doesn't make sense fair enough and the other thing that in I the same universe d- as a guy with a magic glove snaps half of you know e- you know existence out of existence. Yeah, the gill flaps, science on the, the gill, gill flaps. The, the oxygen system of the guys who breathe underwater doesn't work. And visited different dimensions, but the gill flaps. Motherfucker has a little gold flaps. thing on his hand that opens up portals to the other side of the planet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the gill, like that's Look, right. We up, all like, latch onto things that we have knowledge about. Yeah, okay, true, yep. and I know yeah. about. Fish physiology, so <laughs> and I know that that's wrong. It's getting a little bit creepy. But the other, the other thing that I had a bit of a problem with, and I don't know if it's just because I missed it in the film, but partway through the film, 
Um, Okoye like stabs a bunch of guys, and then they come back. Yeah, to there's life. no explanation for this. And they're like, what the fuck? there's no explanation for that. <laughs> they just fucking reanimate. Like, yeah. What about you, waffles? How the fuck do you bug Kamoyo beads? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah like, true. Just like, oh, we bugged her. It's just like, that's some of the most advanced technology on the fucking planet. How the fuck can the CIA bug them? Yeah. Like, that fucking got me. It's just like, no, no. I've got more to, I've got yeah, more to say there in a little true. bit. Yeah. I, I was like, well, what the fuck? <sighs> like, that made no sense. Like, that took me out of it. Like, it was just like, I am, like, actively suppressing every scene that had Martin Freeman in it because like those could just fuck right <laughs> off but like that scene like physically hurt me watching it yeah. I was just like no no to to kind of to kind of jump off from that as well the scene that got me and has changed Martin Freeman's character entirely for me was the scene where they're sitting in that boardroom and the the US government officials are saying we're thinking of doing I can't remember the specific sentence, but they essentially said, we're going to do a Latin America yeah, we're going to destabilize Wakanda. Destabilize Wakanda, yeah. We're going to destabilize Wakanda. We're going to destabilize Wakanda. And then the CIA director says, well, Everett Ross, Martin Freeman, is our expert on that. Martin Freeman's character has destabilized Latin American company, uh, countries and installed fascist dictators. It's the like, CIA. He's a horrible person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's, he's been... like. Yeah, like I'm not surprised by that because like he's been CIA from the beginning, and I just I haven't liked. I guess, him since he but was like you could you could explain that away. Like he's just he's just not been doing that. But they've explicitly now told us he's an expert in nation destabilization. Yeah, like there was a he's reason a they person. put him on the Wakanda case. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's a bad person. Yeah, exactly. The um the one for me is that Namor or his people didn't just or you know a tumor and Namora, they didn't just fucking axe re within seconds of getting her. You know, like when they're on the bridge and they've got a dead to rights, you know, like Shuri should have been, Hey, take me to meet your king and they would have been like, Cool, it's like, by the way, I want the protection of Re and they're like, Oh, you're talking about that corpse over there. Like that was their whole thing, was they mm. wanted to murder this girl to stop her from you know, creating a vibranium detector, yet they don't do it the first second that they've got their hands on him. So, yeah. Bullshit. I it's think it might have been an honor thing. Nah, they've got yeah. no honor. They're like, look at these people, you know, like they're popping up, they're disposing corpses. You know, they don't give a shit. They don't well, give a no, fuck. Well, no, because Atuma had the chance, like Atuma had the chance to kill her, and then he was just like, mm. no, he, so he kicks the spear back to Akoya, and it's just like, she, like we're having a fight at the moment. I'm going to honor that. So I think there was a bit but of I also, honor I, there, but I also found that scene very weird though, because he kicks the spear to her as like a you know, like a warrior's honor type thing. Literally the next line he says is, you're not worthy of my ass. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. so why the fuck yeah, didn't you like, just kill her immediately? Like, I, I've just realized what the next question is, which was a Patreon question, which comes courtesy of our man, uh, Dan Brennick of the Netflix and Swill podcast and awesome podcast. Oh, that's what, I thought that was the question answer. <laughs> I also thought that. I was like, oh, Pat, oh, I haven't Pat, seen that. Yeah, oh, Pat. <laughs> Who's Pat? <laughs> it's Pat. Um, I, like the question is, who's the true MVP of this film? I mean, we're all going to agree it's like Queen Ramonda, right? It's <laughs> you see, it says can't be main, and I would argue she's a main mm. character. Uh, yeah, I also knew that you guys would go with Ramonda, I mean, so I didn't. Yeah, choose yeah. Her. I mean, like we we can obviously make it. But I mean, I've got her. I've just written. Have I not given everything? Mm. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. But like the, the yeah. only reason I didn't put put her there is because I counted her as a main character. Yep. I I put down uh, one of the teachers at the Haitian school because you know teachers, especially Haitian teachers, uh, deserve a lot more respect. Yep. And and so like yeah, give them a pay rise. Fuck yeah, yeah. So like yeah, MVP teachers, you know, deserve better. Fair enough. Um, because like I don't know, maybe I just had like a higher standard of who was a main character or not. I'm interested <laughs> to see what you guys. Think. Well. I just spent the last five minutes bagging him <laughs> and he was a horrible person. <laughs> but I did write down, I did think Everett Ross, Martin Freeman's character, was the MVP of the film. <laughs> the colonializer destabilizer MVP. Now, to, to kind of <laughs> classify this, I think it's because he did legitimately put everything on the line yeah. to give intel to Wakanda that the US were probably going to do something here. And he didn't necessarily have to do that. 
he, you know, he, you know, and he got arrested for it in the end yeah. and stuff. Like, you know, it was turning out pretty bad for him, and he could have just full on ignored that. I'm um, fully going to segue into the next question, which is what was the stupidest decision made by an otherwise sensible character? Because I had Everett Ross <laughs> think he's not bugged, thinking these people aren't fucking following him. Like, you might say he's the MVP. I think he's a fucking moron. <laughs> I think he's CIA. Yeah, yeah, he should be paranoid as anything. Exactly. Like, yeah, true. I assumed that they'd bugged his phone. I mean, they did, he did say, like, near the start that, like, they're watching him and all this yeah, shit. Yeah, so, but, like, for, like, they're watching me. I'm just going to have open, like, he wasn't even trying to speak in code. Like, I can't, like, how long has he spent, like, studying Wakanda and he hasn't picked up a word of the language? Like, he, he shows up on, on the on the scene of the bridge and it's like playing Where's Wally, but there's nobody else on the page except for Wally. He turns around and he's like, oh, the beads. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. come on, bro. <laughs> come on. Come on. <laughs> Like, oh man, yeah. Anyway, what about you guys? What else? What else for stupid decisions made by otherwise sensible characters? Nakia killing the Tolokan. Yep. Like, not even trying to stabilize. Like, at least put some effort in to be like, like she was like fully like straight up hostile in that scene, mm. and like for an otherwise like empathetic and caring character, just like killing somebody in cold blood and then not even trying to save them, like just seemed a bit. Like, I get she was rushing, but like, come on, like. A little bead in there to stabilize, like or something. At least try. Mm, yep. And there was uh, there was the thing. It was like she says, "Oh, you know that this gun is lethal at this range." Yeah. I'm like, that has literally never stopped any of you before. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> but also then, you know, they know that gun is lethal, and it's only ever in that scene. And then it's like, let's go fight the Tala Khan. And it's just like, why hasn't everybody got one of those? Like, yeah. Well, this kind of that that we're great at segues this episode. <laughs> This kind of leads me into my answer for this, which was towards the end, they're like, how, like, we get to choose the, like, the battlefield yes. here on yes. where we get to fight. Yeah, what more. the fuck? Let's do it on the fucking water. And I'm like, okay, but we've already established that that's where they're the most powerful. I appreciate you've got this big fucking battleship or whatever, and they're going to have to climb on and stuff. But, like, they're just going to drag you down. Yeah. Like, but they, and they only why would two planes. Like, where's the rest of the air support? Like... Yeah. Was, also, oh God, the yeah. other thing, the other thing that I found interesting here is I later learned that this wasn't just the Wakandan army. This was specifically the Wakandan navy, and I'm like, but Wakanda's a landlocked nation. Yeah. Why would it have a navy? But also, like, <laughs> so maybe like fifty guys. Like, and yeah, they're all on top of the ship. Yeah. Yeah, they're all on top of the ship. Like, what the fuck is going on they're in like, the rest of the ship? Is it all just engine room? Like, like they're just like they're standing on the ship. Like, were they standing there the entire? Like, what was that journey out there like? Yeah, and then at the end, they're all like, there's like literally ten of them left. Y you know, they're all surrounded by the telecon, and it's like, oh no. And then it's like, yeah, great guys, we won. Like, we're all don't worry, now. we're all at peace now, yeah. guys. They literally murdered like fifty. <laughs> yeah, of exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. Like, that's like I appreciate like the two like the two monarchs are all well and good and that's all yeah, fine. Like, the rest of your nation is going to be super fucking yeah, exactly. Yeah, like they, like they, they went and had a shag in that <laughs> ship and they're all good and this is like exactly this, uh, euphoria. Yeah. Like like I'm just imagining the end of World War Two with like um you know Churchill and Hitler just like holding hands in the middle of Berlin, being like we're friends exactly. now. Like if you think like to, I guess to give it a more modern perspective is like. 9-11 wasn't even an attack on the presidency no. and the united states went all in oh yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 you know and you're thinking like and you think like this is a this is a direct not just an assassination of the leader of a sovereign nation all these people died your sovereign died and you think your entire nation is just gonna gonna let that happen yeah. and just be okay with that i think there's some I don't, well, I don't know if they're ever going to address this, but I think in Wakanda's future is some intense internal civil turmoil. Well, well, that's kind of why how I feel like they were setting up for the next film and where Wakanda goes from here was the fact that Mbaku at the end was like, I challenge for the leadership of, you know, Wakanda. Mm. Like, I can see it. Like, I can see Shuri become the next Black Panther, whereas Mbaku's the leader of Wakanda and, like, we're yeah. going to get some other weird shit happen from there. So, Which I think if, if, if Everett Ross was my first mvp mbaku would be my second oh he's the because, man because yeah. so like good. he's, he's like the only guy out. that yeah. clocks like, what is actually going on yes but this was the thing was he 
initially says we should just kill the fish man and everyone's like that's fucking stupid and then when presented with diff- when he's presented with new information he changes his perspective and says i don't think we should do that because they think he's a god or they call him the name yes, of a ooh, god ooh. Ah, yeah. Yeah, 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 like he should like, be the leader of Wakanda. He he should he's be. He's a good Wakanda. leader. Yeah. He's a <laughs> he smart. He might be the dude. only one to actually bring peace to Wakanda. Yeah, and like. I think his is his is arguably the most interesting interesting transition from the two films, where he's initially presented yes. as this like hulking beast of a man who mm. who just wants to Ooh. beat people up and stuff, and suddenly he's like kind of empathetic when he's going out to to talk to Shuri kind of being like, you know, the elders want to come to Jabari land. And what do you think about that? Mm. And like, again, changing his perspective, given new information and stuff. And it's like, he's the only one that's actually like making correct decisions here. Absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. know, plus he, he's eating healthy. He's, he's got that carrot. At the yeah. Beginning, you know, he's looking after himself. <laughs> yeah. He's fit. Like, yeah. yeah. Anywho, that moves us over to question number seven. Stacey's favorite question. How would you have incorporated Nicholas Cage? into this film i just went for the funniest answer um which was giving him queen ramonda's role and have him do the big speeches <laughs> uh, i just think like, you, you really want to see it like 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 you want to you know slow down for a car crash sort of thing it's like you want to see it but do you really mm. you know? i don't think i don't just think imagining it's, him in that dress with that hat yeah like, i don't think it's a good answer um but i think it is an entertaining answer <laughs> yes absolutely completely agree <laughs> I would have replaced him with Everett Ross. Like I think, like he would have been interesting either that mm. or the uh, U.S. representative at the uh, United Nations. Oh mm. yeah. Shit, yeah, that's, that's a good one. one. Like, I think like give him like give him a small role that he can chew. Like yeah. I think that would have been. Good. I, I think that's a good uh, answer. I, I can't imagine Julia Louis Dreyfus stooping that low, but like yeah, no. Nah, <laughs> the second answer is good. Um, the one for me is like Doctor Doom was heavily rumored in terms oh. of like Latveria was going to pop up or some point. And so you're thinking, oh, you would have had him as Doctor Doom. Fuck no. In the Sensational She-Hulk <laughs> comics, there was Bob Doom who popped up. It was Victor Von Doom's, like, distant cousin or brother or some shit. <laughs> who was pissed off of all of Doctor Doom's success and uh, was a bit of twisted man. I want Nicholas Cage to be Bob Doom. There we go. Ah, yes. <laughs> so Bob Doom from Latveria. That would have been fucking hilarious. It's so nice. good. Here's some deep Marvel cuts oh. for you. Um, question number eight, always a fan favorite. What is it, Thomas? Uh, what quote from this film would be the worst to hear after sex? How will we know if it works? If it glows. (laughs) (laughs) It's pretty, it's so pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) I just love how open-ended that is of like, if it glows, it's like, (laughs) you what like um, <laughs> you just stare there looking under the blankets being like is it glowing is it glowing <laughs> did it work <laughs> it's just my heart shape here baby <laughs> <laughs> you should go see a doctor <laughs> you've got serious radiation poisoning <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, yeah probably <laughs> um my one was I am not a woman who enjoys repeating herself. Who are you? (laughs) 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 Mine was, if I sit and think about my brother for too long, it won't be these clothes I (laughs) burn. That was on my list. That was was on my list. I was like, that's really good. My other one that you haven't mentioned was, you're not worthy of my blade. It's like, well, am I worthy of your sheath? (laughs) (laughs) Like, I had that as a response. And the other one was, he's coming for the surface world. I was like, (laughs) (laughs) what? (laughs) What the fuck do you mean by that? (laughs) Oh, my God. I love that question. (laughs) It's so good. Let's move us over to question number nine. What is it, Waffles? Uh, what character would you definitely not want to be trapped into a lift with? Oh, this is a tumour, 100%. Like, <laughs> he's going to stink. You know what I mean? He's going to smell like fish. Mm. That dude is one fishy-smelling man. Plus, he's a fucking dick. You know what I mean? Like, he's... <laughs> yeah. 
Like, at least the more you'd be I, like, I would... oh, cool, you've got like wings on your ankles and you could chat to him about that. And he'd like, no, he'd kill me as well. Who am I kidding? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I said Mbaku. I also like, said Mbaku. Dude's a vegetarian. He's got some farts. Well, I, I said because he's like a big guy, right? So, like, if if it's like a particularly small lift, like, there's not oh, much yeah. room left in there. Yeah, he was a runner-up. That's a good good answer as mm. well. Yeah. Get Mbaku and, and a tumor. And he just trapped in between them. <laughs> Awful. Be really having a great time. <laughs> Fuck that. Uh, moves, us, <laughs> moves us over to question number 10 what unimportant life lesson did you guys learn from this film I feel like mine wasn't unimportant so I feel like I failed the question <laughs> uh, <laughs> but there's, there's this interesting sub theme that I found interesting um, of this kind of past versus future tradition versus science kind of thing going on particularly between Shuri and Ramonda and I don't think the film does a very good job of acknowledging that this sub theme even exists or resolves it, really. Again, going back to there's a lot going on. But I think there's a good lesson in that, that it is somewhat shown that the two don't have to be at odds. There is, you know, so a Ramonda's description of feeling T'Challa in the wind is just as, and maybe even more important than Shuri's knowledge that scientifically that isn't actually real and is as a figment of her imagination, essentially. Mm. And so I thought that that was kind of, I don't know, quite poignant in that sort of thing. It's kind of, it's quite relevant to a lot of the stuff that's going on here, particularly in New Zealand, um, with things like Mataranga Māori and that sort of thing, trying to com- quote unquote compete against uh, Western science, which um, really they shouldn't be. They're two knowledge structures that are designed to do different things and they don't need to be at odds against each other but western sciences tend to be quite derogatory to mataranga maori and so i thought that was there's a bit of that going on in there of like kind of reconciling those two things and realizing that those two schools of thought essentially don't necessarily need to be opposed they can Mm. coexist and even help each other in various ways so again, I feel that it's quite an important life lesson. Um, so I feel like I failed the question. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if it makes you feel better, I'm just going to skip ahead you waffles. I went for one that's like yeah. kind of facetious, kind of sarcastic, which similar to you was like the imp- unimportant life lesson learned from this film was that America and France like fucking around in other countries' affairs, in particular Africa. Yeah. Man, who would have guessed that? Yep. Who would have fucking guessed that? Who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk it? I think it, it was a very good choice to choose France as being the other oh, major power yes. that was on that table, right? They could have chosen anyone else. The United States was obviously gonna gonna be there because it's the United States very relevant to the plot. But they could have chosen anyone else to be there. And I think yep. it was very good that they chose France. Yes, um, <coughs> Rainbow Warrior. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> but like the obvious, the other obvious answer would have been Britain. Exactly, so, exactly. Like Britain would oh, have been yeah. like almost two on the nose. It's like America and Britain mm, being dicks again. It's just like yeah, we get that. But the fact, mm. like, if you look into French history with Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, and in even Haiti, you know, they end up in Haiti, and it's just like yes. there's yes. so much of that. Influence. Oh, I, I think that was deliberate choice. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Of having yeah. France as the bad guy and Haiti being actually sort of represented quite well. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So again, I've, I've gone contrary to the question as well. <laughs> no. My show. See now fuck I you, feel bro. like a. <laughs> See now I feel like a dick because my answer is gin and vodka don't mix very well because that was the cocktail that I drank while watching this. <laughs> I feel that it's also an important life lesson. Is is yeah, yeah. those things don't mix. Uh... True. <laughs> no, it, it was a cocktail that the the cinema was doing special. They called it liquid vibranium. It was nice, but. Boy, was it strong. <laughs> My other one that um, was quite funny was talking about in, in cinema experience, because I haven't been back to the movies in such a long time that I was like, yep, young child. I was like so excited to just be like back at the movies and fully immersed in it. And I, and I showed up and like, you know, I was talking about the woman in front of me. There was a guy two seats away from me. He was there by himself. And when the trailer for Avatar came up, me and him both sighed like, oh, fuck. <laughs> And so I feel like the unimportant life lesson I've learned is that other middle-aged men, whatever you want to call us, like we both, we all hate this fucking new Avatar film. No one could give a fuck about this Avatar film. 
Don't need okay, it. Well, <laughs> I'm I'm excited for the film, so <laughs> well, I'm I, I want to see arts. it. So. Okay, next question's no, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thomas. On to you. On to you. Yeah, these are oh, these are my questions. Yes, um, onto the personal ones. Yes. So, predictably, uh, most of mine are to do with history, or in some regard. So, as we kind of mentioned earlier, Namor is Namor is his kind of Spanish name that he is called by his enemies. He says, but he's called by his own t- people. He calls him. They call him Kuku Kang, which is actually the name of a real Mayan god. It's actually the leader of the Mayan pantheon and of course we've seen a few new gods in the latest thor film one of those specifically being mentioned which is tumatoinga which is the um maori god of war and creator of humans and a few other things so which god slash person named after said god because namor isn't actually kuku khan he's actually just named after that god but which person named after a god of any pantheon, do you think would present the Black Panther with a credible threat? Maui. He's a demigod, though, so... The rest of the sun. <laughs> That's true. He did a lot of a lot of stuff. Yeah. He did a lot of stuff. I think Maui could take yeah, it. I, yeah. That's just how good our gods in New Zealand are. That our demigod... Our demigod is... <laughs> beat the shit out of the sun. Like... Yeah. Our demigod like, our beat the one. full god of the sun. What you got, Hercules, you bitch? (laughs) Fuck you, Apollo. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. I I was going to be a smartass and be, given how how much Namor fucking gave them shit in this, what about Quetzalcoatl? What about Quetzalcoatl? Oh, yeah. Well, that um, is Kuku Khan's other name, but fuck it. (laughs) Yeah, so Quetzalcoatl is, um, sorry, Quetzalcoatl is uh, his Aztec. Uh, variation yes so it's like zeus and jupiter kind of thing going on there they're effectively the same god Uh, i was like i'm gonna dig a little deeper like surprisingly i know a lot about greek gods and i was like okay who was zeus afraid of zeus was afraid of nyx who was like the goddess Mm. of darkness who was also Mm. like a creationary god i believe like i was like do you start going down yahweh or Allah or like one of those like omnipresent omni uh, you know like i feel that like, they're too I feel extreme. That cheating. Yeah, that that's is too cheating. extreme. Yeah. It's too yeah. extreme. Like, yeah, yeah. I was like, so you got to go with one that's like just the god of something. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to mm. go with that. Got to go with Nyx. There we go. Yeah, that's fair. And effectively, if we're going with like the Christian one, Jesus is not presenting a credible threat to the Black Panther, is he? <laughs> no, my, my, my Catholic upbringing. Yeah. So I had to fight and repress my Catholic upbringing <laughs> to say Jesus. The answer is obviously Jesus. The answer is obviously Jesus, yeah. <laughs> Um, my answer was also a uh, Māori pantheon answer, which was Tafiri Mātia, um, who's the god of wind and storms and all that sort of stuff. Oh, nice. Um, partially because that's the stuff that I'm researching at the moment. One of the stories, specifically the story that I had in mind when I made this answer, was he pulls out both of his eyes and throws them into the stars to create Matariki, which I thought was like, bro, that's fucking metal as. Like, I don't want to fuck with anyone who's named after that guy. <laughs> like, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty good. The Moldy Pantheon is boss level. It's, it's like, fucking lit. Like, yep. like <laughs> I, the other one that I had was an honorable mention for Rongo Matane, because Rongo is typically the god of cultivated food and peace. But there is a story that I found where Tumatoinga and Rongo, the god of war and the god of peace, team up together against Tane Mahuta, the god of the forests. And at one point, Rongo is like, we should go all out. Total war, no mercy, fucking go for it, kill everyone, burn everything, because we want to beat him. And even the literal god of fucking war goes, bro, you should chill out. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So honorable mention to Rongo, who made the literal god of war tell him, maybe not. <laughs> Some of the fuck down, bro. Yeah, Whoa, exactly. Get down a few levels. <laughs> um, going back to Jesus, like uh, Jesus would be no adversary whatsoever for the Black Panther. But in terms of Namor and all his people, like, could you imagine just Jesus rolling out water into wine, bitches? <laughs> <laughs> I'm tying gag. It's all just. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I like one way to do it. <laughs> you could just go full Abrahamic, go like get Moses, just like part, part the, the sea, part the yeah. sea. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck, that would have been hilarious. <laughs> just a tumor, you're not worthy of my. Hang on, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you're not worthy of my. <laughs> <laughs> and out. <laughs> anyway, question number two from you, Thomas. Yes. Um, so when drinking the heart-shaped herb, what ancestor, or I guess what historical figure would you want to see to give you advice? So so I've got a an Irish relative that's a bit of a legend in our family. It's a you know, Hurley's obviously an Irish name, and this is a, a story that's been passed down through the Hurleys. Um, so apparently the story goes that back in the 1800s, a local priest came around and said, okay, it's time to pay your standard Catholic taxes or, you know, whatever they call it sort of thing. And we were like, yeah, sweet as whatever, paid it. And then he came back the next day and asked for more taxes, at which point he came across one of my great, 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 great grandfathers who was incredibly drunk and punched out the priest. <laughs> Nice. We were then kicked out of Ireland and sent to England, where our family <laughs> migrated. <laughs> I don't know if being kicked out of an entire fucking country is called migration, but that's how we ended up in England before we eventually came to New Zealand. So I want to meet that dude. First of all, I don't know if the story is true. It's just a story that's been passed down through my family, and, you know, I'm sure we embellished it. You know, I'm sure there was probably, by the time I tell my kids, there's going to be five priests, and we smoked all of them. <laughs> <laughs> But who knows? I was was the real. He punched himself. Yeah. True story, by the way. I'm not making that up. It's what grandma told me no, when I was, I was six believe. years old. And I've never forgotten it. <laughs> <laughs> who the fuck deals that to a six year old? <laughs> hey, if a priest comes around your door, punch him in the fucking face. <laughs> punch him. Okay. I went with Alfred the Great. He's commonly known for being the first king of England. That's false. Um, he wasn't, it was his grandson. He's also credited as being the first person to institute the British Navy. That's also false. But what he did do was he more or less united most of England, or at least what Anglo-Saxon parts of it were left. He's got this whole thing of, like, he's quite good at war, he's quite good at peace, and I feel like if I was in Shuri's situation, he would be that guy to be like, which option do I choose? Do I kill... No more do I not? Mm. What about you, Waffles? Some of you might know. Waffles, not my real name. What? It's uh, actually... Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, Who the fuck are you? Um, <laughs> well, I'll tell you. My real name's actually Alex, and my dad is called Philip. For yeah, history buffs out I there, know where this is know. going. There's another pair of Alexander and Philip, and I would just have them. Because they were like some of the greatest strategists of their time. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so both Alexander and Philip of Macedon, I would have a good chat with. Because I think, A, they seem like interesting people. And uh, B, you know, both of them unbeaten in their time. Okay, but yeah. did he punch out a priest? <laughs> did he punch out a priest? <laughs> did he, mm, I don't know. I'm I not think, quite sure. I, I the think, history. to be fair, I think there's a non-zero <laughs> chance that he did. So, <laughs> yeah. Would not surprise me. Yeah. Cool. Any final question, Thomas? Yeah, my final question um, does revolve around a slight bit of controversy, um, which was Ooh. that they, because uh, Letitia Wright did come out as being anti-vax and all that sort of stuff, so there was a big call to, you know, we already knew that she was going to be given the mantle of Black Panther, but there was a big call after that came out to give it to someone else. I wondered, what if Disney had gone a different way? And who was the worst character that they could have given the mantle of Black Panther to? The, the, the I mean, I feel like the obvious answer here is Everett Ross, the great white saviour. <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, white panther. <laughs> could you imagine it? Could you imagine <laughs> how much shit you'd throw at the screen before walking out? Like, fuck that. Mm. Yeah. Um, how come there's not a white panther? Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I went with a slightly different answer, um, which was I thought M'Baku would be a really bad black oh. panther because his whole deal is like brute strength and and that sort of stuff whereas the black panther has to be quite sort of live and flexible so i thought he'd be quite bad for that because he's just kind of not built for it <laughs> anywho uh that takes us to the end of thomas's questions on to me so red guardian for russia black panther for wakanda and now introducing brown kiwi for new zealand 
what's the brown kiwi's backstory costume and superpowers and uh, um for our, for our listeners you're going why the fuck are you naming um a superhero after a fruit no kiwi is a bird kiwi is like <laughs> mm. what we call ourselves <laughs> kiwi is the you know like our national animal or whatever kiwis is what we represent as so and there is there's a little brown kiwi there's you know so brown kiwi just makes sense but um yeah come on guys hit, hit me with it what's the backstory costume and superpowers for some reason, my brain went to the trenches of Gallipoli and is a guy, Kiwi guy, dresses himself up as mud, in mud, thus the brown, you know, and will crawl into the Turkish trenches to gather information and sabotage things. And he gets this reputation among the, he sort of becomes a bit of a legend. Nobody knows who he is, but there's this brown Kiwi that's, you know, braving the Turkish front in order to gather information and sabotage things. And... Yeah, like a war hero that then, you know, develops into something more. That is way fucking better than what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Should we just skip you? Or just... <laughs> sure, we can skip to me. But I'm just sitting there like, as soon as you're like, oh, he's from Gallipoli and he covers himself in mud, I'm like, fuck, he's already got me beat. <laughs> like, he's one sentence in and I'm already, mine's already more shit than that. <laughs> Okay, let's hear it. Oh, no. <laughs> Come on, you got to... Because I, had, I had this idea, of course. I was kind of thinking, like, he's got to drink something to to get, like, his abilities. <laughs> oh, don't So, of course, naturally, I chose Charnui as oh. the thing that he's got to drink. <laughs> okay, I, I, was, I was waiting for double brown. I was like, this is going to get... No, yeah. no Charnui. He's got to drink Charnui. Yeah, Charnui is... Yeah, that makes sense. To get his... <laughs> to get his... <laughs> That's good. And then his, his costume... <laughs> Is the kiwi fruit mascots that you see <laughs> appearing with the prime minister and stuff? Yeah, this sucks. But this is amazing. And his, and his main power is that he has a really good sense of smell, but the downside is he's got a really long nose. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, if Marvel's listening and is like, we want to do one of these ideas for the next film, maybe take Waffles' idea and not no, mine. No. Definitely take Waffles. Oh, that's, <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Awesome. Uh, question number two. I mean, fuck, it's, it's probably a yes from everyone, but Angela Bassett, Best Supporting Actress Oscar, is this going to be potentially oh, the first yeah. time we see an MTU actor nominated for an acting performance and winning? I don't know. What do you, got, what do you guys reckon? Oh, shit. She better win. If she doesn't, they'll be like, I'm rioting. Like, jeez. Yeah, I think I think like, like she deserves it, but I think realistically has a few things against her of like, you know, in a Marvel film that Hollywood is known to be generally pretty racist. Yeah. She's a woman. Yeah. That being said, like I feel like this will be looked at as potentially a legacy Oscar for the fact that she's done amazing work for so many years. And like she mm. delivers amazingly in this, but you know, the problem mm. with that is there's another huge Hollywood actress that also delivered an amazing performance this year, which was which was Jamie Lee Curtis and everything everywhere all at once. And she's never Ooh, won an yeah. Oscar. So it feels like this is the clash of two Hollywood titans that have potentially never won one. And is it a Martin Scorsese situation where he's like never won a best director Oscar, but hey, we'll give it to him for departed. So it's like, hey, do we give one of these girl ladies a, you know an actress oscar for one of these roles and like i feel like if there's anything that's going to be this like the antithesis to this i feel like it's going to be that mm, yeah yeah anywho uh the world seems to have gone crazy over feet do you guys reckon namor is into some ankle stuff though oh yeah like you you know he's got an only fins <laughs> <laughs> yes I feel like I should have expected that, but I just just didn't. Crush. I've been waiting. <laughs> I've been waiting to drop that joke since I first read that question. Crushed. That was good. That was great. I I think Namor is more into like three D stuff. You know, like because he like lives in the ocean, right? Like with us being on land, we're quite limited in like positions and stuff that that we can be in because of like gravity but i think like he's more into like because he's more free to be doing various positions in different ways because he's underwater i think that's maybe more what he's into is is 
crazy positions that we haven't thought of because because he's underwater. And he can fly. He's joining the Mile Low Club and the Mile High Club. Exactly. In one session. Just, just think of the 69 <laughs> potential, you know, like Ooh. that lucky fish. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anywho, that moves us over to Waffles for his questions. What do you got there, Waffles? Because I'm a big old comic nerd. Uh, who wins in a fight? Namor, Aquaman, or the Deep from the boys? I feel like it's got to be Namor. And if we're going based on the television or cinematic, you know, equivalent or whatever, I feel like he's got 500 years of experience. We've heard that he's stronger than the Hulk. And the other two fuckfish. <laughs> 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 and I mean, it, it's been a, like, I, don't, I feel like the Deep has had a joke made about him or maybe it's been, thing, whatever, but like, Anyone who's seen Peacemaker, they've established that as canon, that the that, that Aquaman fucks for, like, what the fuck? I've not seen The Boys, so I kind of excluded The Deep from my my analysis, because I don't know anything he, he was about a joke. Him. He was uh, a joke. Man. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but I also agree that I think Namor wins as well, because he can fly, and I don't know what Aquaman's trident is made from but Namor's spear is made from vibranium so I feel like that that's a plus in his corner you know oh yeah cool bring us on to the second question um so Trevor Noah a uh, good old comedian host of the daily show uh was the voice of the AI in was the he yeah it's Trevor it Noah. Was. I genuinely yes. didn't pick that up uh, that's that's uh, yep what celebrity would you get to voice your personal AI Hello everybody, uh, absolutely no idea what the hell happens to my audio from here out, some sort of problem with the website that we recorded it through, but um, it's still listenable, don't adjust your headset is basically what I'm saying, cheers. I'm going to go with a little known celebrity, uh, Denise Goff, and if people are going who the fuck is Denise Goff, anyone that's watched Andor, amazing TV series by the way, anyone that's watched Andor recently, she plays the blonde lady in that who is a massive bitch. But the whole time I was sitting there listening to her and going, fuck, your voice sounds familiar. And then I realized she's the voice of Yennefer out of The Witcher 3. I didn't even give a fuck that you're like the, the villain of this. Like, your voice is so awesome that I'm like, I want to hear that. Mm. So that, that's what swung me around. Yeah, definitely. I also went with the Star Wars answer, actually, as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I Yeah, I, I think... I think I might would have, I probably would have changed my answer had I re- remembered her. Um, but I went with James Earl Jones. Oh, yeah. I think like oh. the, the dulcet sort of tones. Because I was kind of I was kind of thinking like um, if anyone who's played Titanfall, you used to be able to select the the voice that you could that would talk to you for your Titan and stuff. So I was thinking, it's like who would I want to like be that? You know, and I thought, yeah, James Earl Jones talking to me. And telling me my Titan's going to blow up, you should probably get the fuck out of there. That's how I feel. <laughs> Third and final question from me. What was the best costume in the movie, a.k.a. whose clothes did you like the best? I'm going to go with Nomura. I really liked the the blend of the cultures. Um, I, I thought her and Atuma. Atuma was look, kind of actually comic accurate, whereas Nomura was like a little bit of a, you know, sort of take on like the Yucatan Peninsula area mixed with you know underwater people I really liked hers I really liked her you know her outfit her get up I thought she looked awesome yeah I also had the same answer which was basically any of the Talakan people yeah uh, everything about that I thought was really cool there I mean disclaimer I know very very little about Mesoamerican culture and history so I if I did I'd probably have a lot of problems with it as normally is the case when I see outfits that and and things like that that I actually do know things about, I usually have quite a bit of like that's not right and that's not right. So I, you know, citation needed. But I thought that they were really cool. It's kind of funny because in hindsight, I should really be re- editing my answer here to be um, the more you know the fact that she they digitally edited out his penis is fucking. <laughs> A normal man is fucking fake. thanks for that. <laughs> Makes me feel the average dude. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Anywho, that moves us down to our final question, which is a Patreon question. This comes courtesy of our amazing friend, Chris Yenny. You're the fucking man, Chris. So happy to be back doing this and asking a question again. His question, what on the nose song would you drop into this movie and where? 
I'm just going to straight up say I wouldn't change the music in this movie, and that Rihanna song at the end was perfection. Like the only one, other one I could think of was Lonely Islands. I'm on a boat, but like, yep, that Rihanna song deserves so much respect. Like it just was a perfect capstone to this film. So yeah, that's my answer. Or, or when Namor's in the the ship, you know, getting microwaved, they could have played Sweat by Snoop Dogg. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i have to disagree there on your assessment that the mu- music in the film is perfect because i feel that would have elevated the film quite a lot <laughs> i will take a page out of namor's book and admit that i'm wrong <laughs> it's funny today. I was like is there any songs about making people dry and i was like don't be so fucking stupid you know what i mean like <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking perfect god damn it <laughs> yeah I mean um, speaking about that like when, when the boat starts sinking I thought of Crowded House a bit of New Zealand six months in a leaky boat I was like six months in a leaky boat absolute classic absolute classic I was, yep. I was thinking that the only other one is like hey let's interject <laughs> inject another Rihanna song and when this like when Wakanda starts getting flooded why don't we just <laughs> chuck an umbrella <laughs> umbrella yeah, yeah. <laughs> You could say it under my umbrella. I was like, yeah, that would be really fucking stupid and possibly one of the worst songs to chuck in there. <laughs> and that takes us down to the end of uh, of this episode. So thank you to everyone for joining us, but also a massive thanks to these guys. Thomas, tell us about your podcast. Tell us all that sort of uh, all that sort of fun stuff before we sign off. Yeah, hello. I do a very serious podcast. Um, Sometimes episode 100 and 101 are not very serious, but generally they are pretty serious. Um, I do the history of Aotearoa New Zealand, which is very much does what it says on the tin. Um, I talk about the history of New Zealand. Um, You can come listen to me. You can come listen to these guys. Um, Waffles and Sam have fun with me on episode 100. And probably by the time that this goes out, if you don't mind me making a cheeky plug, Sam, uh, it might be right around the time that the New Zealand Podcast Awards are doing their listener choice. Um, (laughs) Please vote for me. Uh, I'm in it. (laughs) So so please vote for me. Um, You might be able to vote for these guys. I don't know if these guys are in it, but I'm definitely in it. (laughs) They're not in it. In all honesty, probably won't matter because people who are much larger than us will Correct. get all the votes. But and that's the thing. Vote for the underdog. Vote for the underdog. Fuck it. Who knows? Maybe. Cool. And on to you, Waffles. Promote your show. Uh, I'm Waffles. You can listen to me at Waffles and Mates Talk About Things. Once again, just like the on the tin, I get my mates on. Uh, we do little comedy stuff. Uh, I haven't got you on, Sam. I've been like racking my brain, uh, and I think I've got a good episode that I think you'd be a good fit. So this is kind of me informally introduced, like saying, hey, come on the show sometime. It'd be great to have you. Anytime. Um, but yeah, I'm a small... Noise. Uh, I'm a small little comedy channel. Yeah, Waffles and Mates talk about things. If you go, you know, want to laugh for half an hour a week, check me out. Correct. Links to these guys' podcasts will be down in the show notes, as always. Uh, on to discussions about us. There is a potential that we might be doing Violent Night, which if you haven't seen the trailer for that film, you should. That film looks fucking awesome. So we might actually do two episodes where we do an episode on Violent Night and how awesome that film is. Uh, so who knows what we're going to do for our other Christmas special, but we will we'll do something. We'll do something, and then we will be back full-time in the new year once, uh, once my little one is a little bit more manageable. But, um, yeah, anywho, that is thanks from me. All right. Peace out. Goodbye. Our first one-star review was, I put this podcast on before I got in the shower, and oh my god, I hated listening to it. I was trying to get out of the shower to turn it off, but I had to finish my shower. I was reading, I was like, this, this, can't, this can't be fucking real, right? <laughs> no. This can't be fucking real. <laughs> like, just dry your hands and skip. Like, it's not that hard. <laughs> it's not that hard. My wife's gone and reviewed me again. Good work, girl. <laughs> a lot, a lot, I think the general theme for this film was, like, representation. A lot of representation for various different groups um which i thought was really cool and so that's why we got three white guys on to 
to uh, <laughs> to talk about. I was this. wondering how quickly before one of us brought it up, and there it is. 